Um, but our focal verse for this particular lecture is 2 Peter chapter 3. And the concept that we're going to be looking at is the concept of uniformitarian, uniformitarian thinking or uniformitarianism. That concept has led many people astray and has been used as a tool to commit um, a, a lot of deception and error. But we shouldn't be surprised. We should not be surprised when Unitarian thinking is used to deceive people and to avoid the truth, uh, the truth about what has happened in the history of our world. The Apostle Peter says, First of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. So in other words, the motivation behind this deception is not a noble motivation. They will say, where is this coming he promised? They're talking about the return of Christ. Christ promised that there would come a time when he would return to earth bodily, and he will. But many, because that, has, uh, that promise was made roughly 2,000 years ago, would say, I don't think that promise is worth anything because he's not here yet, and it's been a long time. So they scoff about that, saying, where is the coming that he promised? And then they go on to commit the uniformitarian fallacy. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. In other words, they are assuming that things have pretty much operated uniformly since the beginning. Now, that's not true. Uh, the, the history of our world and the history of the universe is not one that has been uniform. It's one that has been interrupted by an enormous catastrophe called the flood. But they're ignoring that. Uh, and, of course, if you are a God-scoffing person, it is embarrassing to think about God judging the world, judging sin, and destroying a sinful humanity with a global flood. So the flood is a very inconvenient truth. And as a result, it is ignored. Ignored on purpose. You could say this is an example of stupid on purpose. Okay, so ever since our fathers died, the scoffers say, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. Acting as though we can assume that the world has operated in a uniform way ever since the beginning. But that's not true. And Peter gives the specific, two very specific examples of God's uh, special activity in the history of our universe. But they deliberately forget, they, they willfully ignore that long ago by God's word the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. So, one huge miracle, nothing uniform about it creation week, what we read in Genesis chapter 1, what God did on days 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 before he rested on day 7, all of what took place in days 1 through 6, they were, it was supernatural. There was nothing uniform about it. It only happened once. It will never happen again. There is, it, it is not comparable to anything else. It is unique. It is a unique set of events from the past that's no longer observable. It's not uniform. And if we want to understand what happened during creation week, we cannot make the assumption that the earth always operates in a uniform way. If we make that assumption, we are guaranteed to get it wrong. The second example comes up in verse six. By these waters, that is the waters that God created from the beginning, also, the world of that time was deluged, that is, flooded, completely flooded, flooded to where even the highest uh, mountain peaks were covered over and then some, over the top. By these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. That's not uniform. Thankfully, we don't have a worldwide flood every day. Um, <clears throat> I, I was born some time ago. Uh, I've lived on this earth for long enough to be the grandfather of eight children, uh, eight grandchildren. And yet I have never seen a worldwide flood, and I never will, because God promised that there would only be one and never again. 
So there's nothing uniform about the worldwide flood. If you make the assumption that things always happen uniformly, you will get it wrong on everything that involves the worldwide flood. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. There will come a time when another very not uniform activity will take place. Namely, God will destroy this present earth and will have a day of judgment. And that will be a one of a kind. It will be unique. It will not be comparable to anything else. So Peter's point is, if you make the assumption that things are always happening the way that they always have and nothing unusual will ever happen, particularly anything where God himself intervenes, then you will get it wrong. And that goes back to the original criticism of, hey, where is the second coming of Christ? Well, that's not going to happen every day. It's going to happen on one day, and that day is yet future. What we're going to look at in the next few minutes regarding the Viking skeletons that were found in a mass burial in the middle of England, about 300 of them, is that carbon-14, that is the radiometric dating that uses carbon-14 as its basis, was at the heart of a controversy which illustrates how you can get science wrong if you stick with the uniformitarian assumption because the uniformitarian assumption is a fallacy. It is a flaw and it fails the basic principles of forensic science. And what it does is it, it switches what should be studied as a forensic science question as if it was an empirical science question. And empirical science is when we look at what is happening in the now and what continually happens, repeatedly happens. But if you're gonna study something that only happened once and it happened in the past and it's not happening again and there is no repeating, then empirical science methods will not work. And yet when evolutionists want to talk about things in the past that only happened once, they try to apply the uniformitarian principle um, as a substitute for doing it the right way, which we'll get to. Okay, so th this will all illustrate the importance of what Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 3, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Uh, that says form, that's a misspelling, okay? I'm still learning English. And then we contrast that with verse 5. This they willingly are ignorant of, that the original world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. So the Genesis flood was a judgment from God, and it's not at all uniform. It is a catastrophe, and it was a one, of un, one event. Now, the idea of uniformitarian thinking is... Um, the fault of many uh, thinkers, but one of the main ones was Charles Lyell. And he said, it makes sense to assume that geological processes acting in the past were much the same as those we see today. As soon as he says that, he's ignoring the flood. Forces such as sedimentation in rivers, erosion by wind, or deposit of ash and lava by volcanic eruptions. He's also ignoring the, uh, the ice age that followed the Genesis flood. So as a result, he looks at things and he would say, oh, I think what I'm looking at uh, is the result of, of processes that go back a million years before Christ. And, and, that, and that's the assumption he makes. Now, did he live back then? No. Is he an eyewitness? No. So where is he getting that from? He's getting that completely from his imagination, assuming that things are always operating uniformly, which they're not. Now we'll get to carbon-14 and how there is an error in how that method is used. And that method can be used accurately um, many times. But it also, if the assumptions are wrong, can be used um, erroneously. So here's the problem. You have a mass burial site where they find about 300 skeletons. At first they said 250 and then they eventually, when they started counting all the bones and matching them up, they said closer to 300. That was in the 1980s. And 
the uh, historians who were involved in this dig said, oh, we think that these skeletons represent the, the great heathen army of Vikings who were marauding and fighting battles in the interior of England during the 870s. That's who we think these skeletons represent. The bones from those skeletons were subjected to radiocarbon testing using the usual approach that's been used for years. I say, you know, going back to the 50s. And uh, the results that they got were a problem. They said, oh, no, no, these, these carbon-14 results indicate that these bones trace back to people who lived and who died in the 600s or the 700s. Now, living in the 6 or 700s is different than living in the late 800s. So if the carbon-14 radiometric dating methods are as accurate as they were claimed to be, then you shouldn't have an error, uh, an, an error spread that far. So is this a problem of the scientific method that is being used or what's going on, what's going on here? Okay, well, in order to do that, we need to ask the question, how reliable is carbon-14 radiometric dating? Because we've been told for years it's a slam dunk. It is basically error-free. Um, well, the, the burial resulted in 300 skeletons, so it wasn't a problem of not having enough, um, not having enough data to work with. There was uh, plenty of material that they could uh, subject to radiometric dating. And one of the things that they needed to do was to figure out when did the people who these skeletons are the remains of, when did they die? Who used to live inside these bone houses? They found different things in the burials. Sometimes they would find a, a piece of a bird or a piece of a knife, uh, even a, a, an iron knife that actually had the ability to fold or a bronze necklace or some glass beads or a, uh, uh, a Thor's hammer made of silver or a key or a, a belt buckle that had copper in it. So they, they found different things that they could get clues from. But in order to really appreciate what, what the problem was, we need to think about how is radiometric dating uh, used to calculate the time of death of someone, a human, or something, an animal, that once was living. So how do we get radiocarbon? Uh, there are two types of carbon that are often found in the atmosphere, carbon-12 and carbon-13. They're stable, they're not radioactive. But there's a very small percentage of the carbon that is in the atmosphere that is carbon-14. And um, it is radioactive, that is, it tends to, uh, um, to decay. Well, how does it get formed in the first place if it's unstable? We have cosmic rays coming from outer space at high speed and <clears throat> they cause neutrons to smack into nitrogen. Our atmosphere is two-thirds, roughly, uh, nitrogen, uh, nit uh, uh, diatomic nitrogen, two, two nitrogens stuck together. But if one of those nitrogens gets hit by a neutron and it smacks into that nitrogen atom, and causes one of the uh, protons that was in that nitrogen atom to, uh, to, to uh, break off, you now have a carbon uh, at atom because carbon is carbon and neutron, carbon and nitrogen are both defined by how many protons they have in their nucleus. And uh, so you still have the same atomic weight because that's the measurement of adding the protons and the neutrons. You, and so you still have a, a, a 14 as the weight, but you have a different number of protons in the nucleus, and that's what makes it carbon. Well, this carbon can combine with oxygen that's in the atmosphere. Uh, thankfully, we have a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere. And the combination of that carbon and, and a couple oxygen atoms is carbon dioxide. And of course, carbon dioxide has a very important role in our atmosphere. And as far as plants go, 
carbon dioxide combined with water in the presence of sunlight in a, in a, uh, a plant that has the ability to photosynthetically form carbohydrates, the result of that is we get carbohydrates. And so that's how energy from the sun eventually makes it into um, a, a green plant, such as grass or a tree or something else that uh, has photosynthetic capability. And the carbon dioxide and the water are combined into a carbohydrate, maybe a simple sugar, and then ultimately those simple sugars can be joined together into a, a, a larger carbohydrate. And it thankfully gives off in the process of photosynthesis uh, oxygen, uh, O2, that we need to breathe without which. So God's got all these moving parts and he's taking care of a gazillion things all at one time, including our, our need to have oxygen that we can breathe. So some of the carbon from the atmosphere makes it into the carbohydrates that are produced by green plants. And uh, the green plants, oh, let me uh, mention that that's how the animals get it, because the animals are eating the plants. So if an animal eats plants, the animal is getting carbohydrates from the plants into the animal. The animal now has that whatever carbon was part of the carbohydrates that were eaten by the animal. If some of those carbohydrates include carbon that is carbon-14, the animal now has radio, radioactive carbon in the animal's body because of eating. And then if you have a carnivorous animal that doesn't eat plants directly, but eats herbivores, so if you have a, a wild uh, feline that uh, eats a sheep, well, the sheep was eating grass and got the carbohydrates from the grass. Whatever is now part of the sheep is now inside the, um, the digestive system of the carnivore. And so the predator is now getting carbon-14 from the herbivore who got it from eating plants. And we're omnivores. We eat plants as well as we eat meat, so we can get it both ways. We can, we can eat plants directly. We can eat nuts and fruits and grains and root vegetables, and we can get carbohydrates that way. And some of the carbohydrates that we're getting have C14 in them. So we're getting that into our body that way. But if we eat a steak from cattle or we eat mutton from sheep, well, both the cattle and the sheep were eating grass. And so they were getting their carbon-14 from the grass. We can get carbon-14 from eating um, the meat from those animals. So it gets into our food system. It gets into our bodies because of eating food. Uh, eventually, what happens is an organism dies. And that organism, uh, for that matter, could be a plant, but uh, it could be an animal or it could be a human. And when you die, you stop eating. And when you stop eating, you stop taking in carbon-14. So you're, you're no longer taking in, taking in, taking it in. You're left with, that is your body, is left with the carbon-14 that was already in your body when you died. And now that carbon-14, because it's unstable, is not going to stay uh, the same. So it will based on its half-life, degrade over time. And so the longer a body has been dead, the longer amount of time there has been for the carbon-14 that was in that body to degrade over time and to decay and, and to uh, become less. And that's based on a half-life of roughly 5,700 years. And of course, uh, once you start getting into long time frames, like say 100,000, you're not going to have any carbon-14 left that's uh, enough for even measuring, um, which is a real problem for evolutionists because dinosaur bones are found with carbon-14 in them. Well, that means the dinosaur couldn't be millions of years old. Uh, carbon-14 doesn't hang around that long inside a, a, a dead bone. But uh, getting back to our, our Vikings, we need to think about what about the carbon-14 that was inside their bones? And uh, so the, the skeletons 
using the usual carbon-14 calculations, indicated that the deaths of those humans occurred in the 700s or maybe even the 600s. But that didn't match what the historians thought the grave burials were indicating about those who were buried there. For one thing, this happened in the interior of England. So when the Viking Age first starts at roughly 800 AD, the late you know, 790s, the, the first Viking attacks in the British Isles were, were on going up navigable rivers. They were hit and run. So the boats are, are parked, the Vikings jump out of the boats, they, they, uh, they make their attack, they take whatever they're gonna take, they get back in their boats and they escape, hit and run. It wasn't until later in the 800s, uh, in the later 800s, that many of the Vikings decided, we're not gonna hit and run, we're gonna hit and stay and we're gonna conquer and we're gonna take over. And so then you find them active on the interiors of, of places that previously they had only uh, been busy at the navigable rivers. And uh, so historians have disagreed with the carbon-14 dates of the skeletons. And what do you do about that? Well, um, the attitude of the evolutionists, particularly the biochemists who were doing the carbon-14 calculations was, you mean you distrust our carbon-14 dating? How dare you? Well, who was right? Were the biochemists right? Or were the historians right? Could you ever know who was right? Is there, one, is there a way that we could know for sure? Well, for 30 years, the disagreement went on between uh, the, the different uh, scientists who had opinions about the thing. Now, if you look at the map there, um, if, you, if you look for the word repton, R-E-P-T-O-N, that's where these bodies were um, unearthed from. And you can see the activities of the great heathen army uh, on that map showing what was happening in the late 800s. And that's why the historians thought that's what we're looking at. We're looking at bodies that represented people who died in those battles. Um, another interesting thing is well, what do you do if you find coins in the burials? You know, it's kind of hard if you're gonna, if at one depth you have a coin and then you have a skeleton and then another skeleton and then earth and it sits there for hundreds of years and then you dig it up and you pull out one skeleton and another one underneath, another one underneath, and then there's a coin underneath it, all of those skeletons. If that coin is dated in the eight, late 800s, how did that coin get there if the bodies that are stacked on top of it were buried in the 600s and the 700s and their bodies weren't disturbed once they were buried until, until the 1980s? Anyway, that's part of the problem. So what about the great heathen army? Another question was, there's no record in English history and the British people have been literate for a long time, uh, for more than 2,000 years. They've kept records of things. They kept records of, of Julius Caesar's army uh, invading uh, at a you know, before, before Christ. And so they have kept records. And it's always important to keep records of when there's battles in your land. So they had no, in, they had no records that would indicate that anybody had ever seen a large heathen army or a large army of any kind that would result in 300 bodies being buried in the same place uh, in the interior part of England. That's something that if it had actually happened in the 600s or the 700s, there should have been some record of that, particularly when you're dealing with a, a people uh, who had a written language and were using that written language for many, many centuries. So the Vikings didn't go to war inside the interior of England until after 865. And these heathen continued to battle and maraud uh, until 878. There's our raven banner there. Okay. Let's see. Now we get to the importance of eyewitnesses. 
because the gospel that we are given in the New Testament, the good news of Jesus Christ, our Savior, is based on eyewitness testimony. Without eyewitness testimony, we don't know the gospel. Here's what Paul said. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen, that's an eyewitness, of Cephas, that is Peter. Then of the twelve, after that he was seen, more eyewitnesses, of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present. That is, when he was writing uh, 1 Corinthians, that epistle, of the 500 who saw Christ after Christ rose from the dead, um, most of those 500 eyewitnesses were still alive at the time that Paul was writing to the Corinthians. And as a result, you could go talk to those eyewitnesses if you had any doubts. Uh, but of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. That is, some had already um, left this world in death. After that, he, that is Christ, uh, resurrected. He was seen, another eyewitness, of James, then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen, another eyewitness, of me, that is Paul, also, as of one born out of due time. So eyewitnesses are really important for knowing the truth that is the most important truth for us to know. Who Jesus is, the fact that he died for our sins, and rose from the dead, proving that he had defeated death. What about <clears throat> looking at present effects of a cause that existed in the past? Now we can do that. Of course, it's not the same as an eyewitness, but it can be helpful. It can it can supplement what we learn from an eyewitness. An example of that would be the sinking of the Tirpitz, which was uh, uh, Adolf Hitler's, uh, one of his two big battleships that he was so proud of. And this one was, was sunk um, in 1944, uh, November 12th exactly, and it was uh, sunk off the coast of uh, Norway. After the fact, historical causes routinely leave behind physical effects, such as fingerprints, tire tread impressions, blood spatter, DNA, etc. Some of what happened to the turpits and the surrounding area can be inferred from physical effects, such as there are uh, craters that were caused by the tall boy bombs that, that were dropped and exploded near where the turpits was sunk. Not every bomb hit the target. Some of them missed the target, and they went down into the water and, and exploded and, and left a crater. So we, we do see present effects, effects in the present, of causes that, exist, that happened in the past. However, as in all forensic investigations, there is no substitute for a reliable eyewitness. And as it turns out, one of the reliable eyewitnesses of the bombing that day was... Uh, Mimi Fossum, who was a Norwegian uh, resistance agent at that time. She would have been a teenager back then. And um, she's a very delightful lady. She's also very good at Norwegian rose mulling painting, which is pretty similar to Swedish folk painting. Well, what about those coins? Well, as it turns out, the coins that were found were only minted in, within the time frame of 865 to 871. They were never minted before that or after that for those particular coins. So the question, of course, would be, what do you do with those coins if the skeletons that are on top of those coins uh, produce dates of death in the 600s or 700s? Well, here's the analysis on that. Three samples came from burials in Cemetery 3 to the north of the Repton Church, thought to be contemporaneous with the Repton Mass Burial Charnel Deposit. What, these are the Viking double grave and a grave with five coins dated from 872 to 875. Eight samples were selected from within the Charnel Deposit, and they've been dated to 872, 874 using numismatic evidence, that is, based on what kind of coins they were and when those coins were minted. 
from its location, this grave must post-date, that is, it must be after the, the dumping of the dead body into the earth, had to have happened after 862 8 to 8, I'm sorry, has to date after 872 to 874 because the coins that were found there. They had, the coins had to be minted first and then tossed into the dirt and then the skeletons on top, which means the skeletons on top had to be buried after the coins were minted. That's the logic of it. Anyway, the journal sites there uh, are given there. But the conclusion is the evidence that this group of coins provides for the dating of the grave in which they were found is decisive in one respect in that they point to a date for making of the grave no earlier than 873. So what do you do with the carbon 14 dating? <clears throat> We've already looked at how carbon 14 gets into food chains. We've already seen, uh, and if you look at the bottom of the plant on the right, you, you see the, the equation there, the chemical reaction uh, that, that you get carbon dioxide and you add water to it and in the presence of sunlight you end up with a carbohydrate plus some oxygens that we can breathe and we desperately need to be able to breathe. Okay, that's photosynthesis. What are we forgetting? Think about your Viking history. What is forgotten here? Is there some uniformitarian assumption that has been overlooked in this uh, analysis. Well, we know how the goat gets carbon-14 by eating a plant. We know how the plant gets its carbon-14 from the atmosphere. And we know how carbon-14 gets inside human bodies because we eat uh, seeds and nuts and, and meats and root vegetables and dairy products and the dairy products come from animals that were eating grass or they come from uh, uh, the steaks come from animals are eating grass uh, and you know when you think of eating a good piece of ham uh, what was that what was that pig eating well uh, the pig would would likely be eating something that had carbon 14 right but maybe not because what did the vikings like to eat you know, they ate a lot of food when they were traveling. They had to eat what was available and what they could take with them. And you typically eat what's available. And Vikings ate loads of fish. Um, fish are wonderful. And fish live in the ocean. They live in salt water. That is the fish we're talking about. Uh, salmon and cod and herring and uh, uh, trout, sea trout, and you don't get much carbon-14 living in ocean water. Ooh, that would throw off your, uh, your calculations, wouldn't it? Because the assumptions that were made in uh, 30 years ago in the 1980s and continued after that, they were all assuming a land-based human diet that the humans who, rep who were represented by the skeletons had been eating land-based food all the time. And therefore, we could assume how much carbon-14 was already in their body when they died, and then see how much is left, and then, based on half-life, calculate backward in time to, okay, if this is how much is left, then how much did they start, uh, uh, how far do we have to go back in time to get uh, the usual amount that people have when they die. But what if they didn't have that amount to start with? What kind of diets did the Vikings have? Well, of course, they were buying little glass jars of herring from Sweden. Well, maybe not, but they were getting their fair share of herring. And they may not have gone to Ikea to get their salmon uh, or their gravlax, but uh, um, they were certainly f uh, getting their fair share of fish. And so the Vikings w had a, a, not a land-based diet, but a sea-based diet. And that makes a difference in how much carbon-14 came into their bodies while they were alive, which is the maximum that they had to lose after they died and the radioactive decay process started. So they were eating lox and sill and torsk and, and uh, all the different fishes that were available to them. I mean, doesn't that look good? Doesn't that make you hungry? Just to look at that, I mean, that makes me hungry. 
but I, I, we better wrap this up. We can all go eat. Uh, in fact, I mentioned pigs earlier, ham. But what about the Viking pigs? What, what, did their, what did the Vikings hogs eat? Well, they weren't necessarily eating a lot of grain or nuts or fruits. A lot of times, they were eating the fish garbage. So you got Vikings who eat all the parts of the fish they like, the part they don't like. They throw that on the ground. The pigs come and they eat that. So even when, they would, even when the Vikings would eat their own pigs, the meat of their pigs, they weren't getting a lot of carbon-14 that way because the pigs themselves didn't get a whole lot of carbon-14 based on their diet. Pigs will eat fish, and they'll eat fish garbage as well. So Viking pork, not a big source of carbon-14. So here's the wrap-up. The carbon-14-based age assignment for certain Viking bones caused a decades-long controversy until the carbon-14 methodology used to date them was recently exposed for its flawed assumptions showing one size fits all radiocarbon dating doesn't work. The Vikings were known for a seafood diet, specifically fish. And fish contain much less carbon-14 than land-based foods like grains, vegetables, fruits, dairy products, and livestock meats. Therefore, unless dietary differences are adjusted for, carbon-dated skeletons of fish-eating Vikings appear to be about 100 years or more older than they really are. The reason why they don't have much carbon-14 left in their skeletons is not because their skeletons have been uh, decaying C14 for all these many years, it's the skeletons didn't have that much to start with. Um, this gets personal to me. My, uh, my record when I was uh, on the Marco Polo, and this is not a picture from Marco Polo, this is from the Radiance of the Seas, but when I was the first time I visited Stockholm uh, was on the Marco Polo, and on that particular roughly three-week long cruise, uh, I was speaking as a historian, and I had the opportunity then, and I took it, to eat 70 consecutive meals with fish. It was wonderful. Now, a couple hundred years from now, when I die and somebody radiocarbons my bones, they might think that uh, they might think that I, I lived in the 1700s uh, because there's not much carbon 14 in me. But, but that's because of my diet. I prefer a fish-based diet whenever I can. So eat a lot of fish, people will think that you, you died a lot earlier. And uh, so when my skeleton is tested for C14, uh, it's going to give a number that matches my love for salmon, my love for crabs, my love for crayfish, my love for even lutefisk. So here's a, uh, uh, <clears throat> an example of English poetry called a limerick, and I've titled this Seafood Diet Skewed Carbon-14 Dating of Viking Bones. 300 skeletons were found decaying C14 in the ground. But the bone dates were odd due to diets of cod, proving carbon dates often aren't sound. Well, that brings us back to 2 Peter chapter 3. There is a thing called the uniformitarian assumption fallacy. It's used in evolutionary t teaching all the time. And in this case, it actually explains why they got the dates on the Viking skeletons wrong. We've also seen that Eyewitnesses are very important. The reason why they even knew to uh, second guess the C14 dates that were wrong is because there were many eyewitness records of the activities of the great heathen army of the 870s in England. If there had been no eyewitness accounts, we would still be in confusion. Thankfully, God gave us eyewitness accounts, not only of Christ's resurrection, but also of creation week and of the worldwide flood, things that are unique events of the no longer observable past that without reliable eyewitnesses, we just wouldn't know the truth. We can appreciate that. In fact, Peter himself was an eyewitness of Christ's transfiguration on the Mount of uh, Transfiguration. And that's an unforgettable experience. And yet Peter said that having the scriptures is even better than being an eyewitness to Christ glorified right in front of your eyes.
The scripture is fixed in heaven for all eternity. 